in order to have a bubble, we need yeah. to be 12 months or more of inventory. Hmm. We're still under a month of inventory nationwide, which means that we have like 890,000 homes nationwide, nationwide, right? which at the top of the market where, you know, we hit the pandemic, not the pandemic, but the great recession and all that, we had 3.7 million for sale. Wow. There's, yeah. there's a difference, Matt. If you, and, and that's the, the problem right now is, yes, things are going to slow down until we get, you know, but not slow down to a point where we're going to see the values go down. We're just going to see a lot less people being able to buy these homes. And that's yeah. a bad thing because if you look at California, for example, which is, what's happening from here goes there or somewhere else. Yep. You're going to get 70% of the market can only rent. Hey guys, this episode is sponsored by Tranquil Turtle Massage. Tracy over there, the founder, she's a small town girl from Montana, loves God, loves her family, loves her friends, loves working out, fishing and camping. She has a passion for helping those in need and enjoys being creative with woodworking, crocheting, healthy baking, pottery and cooking. Look, she began her massage journey back in 2010 where she graduated from massage school up in Anchorage, Alaska. She specializes in her signature massages, the Hanu Infusion and the Hanu Ashiatsu, as well as the Gua Sha and Manual Lymphatic Drainage. If you're looking for a massage specialist and someone who could get you feeling good, go see Tracy down at Tranquil Turtle Massage. And while you're there, check out CDA Microblading, offering Coeur d'Alene's best tattoo brows, plasma fibroblast, tightening, and PMU services right there in the heart of downtown Coeur d'Alene. Make sure you book your appointment at pnwmobilemassage.com. <laughs> Ed, you're a U.S. Navy veteran, entrepreneur, speaker, coach, mortgage broker, host of Real Estate Jerky, podcast host of Inner Edison Podcast, also helping the Brave Podcast. Thanks for your service. Thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Anytime, man. I appreciate being on your show. You were on my show, I think it was a year ago almost. Yeah. And yeah. Um, you were doing your 100, got to get to 100 episodes. And I was like, it wasn't so much with that. And I know it's supposed to be about me, but I'm going to talk about you. Yeah. Uh, and basically, you know, I, you're, what you're trying to do and strive for, not only that, but what you stand for, I thought it was really important to have you on my show. So thanks for being on my show. Oh, man, it was an honor, dude. I'm so glad to be jamming with you again, dude. Yeah, I ended up finishing 117 interviews in 2021, man. It was, it was a wild year for sure. Um, I like to go back, though, with my guests. Like, where did you grow up? What was childhood like for you? Um, uh, some would say it sucked. But anyway, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah. I grew up, so I, went, I was born in Burlingame, California, which most people don't just San Francisco airport. That's okay. Gotcha. All right. And I have no idea because when I was a kid, I left. We went to Colorado and then we went from Colorado to California constantly, depending on when my dad got the next advancement. And then when I was 12, we had moved back to California and into Turlock. And that's right, right close to where I live now, Modesto. And he passed away when I was 12 of Harry cell leukemia, which was from Agent Orange. But at the time, they denied those claims. So just sure. enough time that our government does to not have to pay things out. Right. And um, then so I went through high school in Turlock and said, I got to get out of this valley. There's no way I want to live here. And joined the Navy to see the world. And I got to see San Diego and Texas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i mean yeah. when you were still in high school though like you were working for your grandfather's dairy what was that experience yeah, yeah. like man well so that was the, so after my dad i so when we moved out here i'd be at my grandfather's dairy you know because that's where my dad and I, we'd go to help him out and you know weld stuff i learned how to weld learn how to use you know all the tools that not normally people would learn we we fixed everything on site okay and then after my dad died i i kept going out there weekly weekends summers you know milk and cows fun uh, moving sprinkler pipe at 110 degrees in the, in the summer, Been you know, there. walk, move it over, you know, with that 10 feet and then put it back together and keep going. And I yep. was like, why don't we have those ones with the wheel? And he's like, it's expensive. Right. You know, he's a Jersey dairyman where they, all that milk went to just cheese. And it's still this, the Hillmar cheese company is still there, but they sold their dairy years ago and they've all passed away since then. But yeah. for me, I learned, you know, how hard work really is. Yeah. Right. You know, that whole statement when hard times make hard people, weak times make weak people. I won't say where we are right now, but um, we'll keep moving and keep this non-political. This is not my radio show, uh, but it's just important to, you know, you work your butt off and you learn a lot. Yeah. And, you know, I'd haul hay and st how to stack hay, how to use trucker knots, you know, stuff I would never learn any other time. And I still use a lot of that stuff to this day. Hmm. So, you know, I love I, that, man. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, I, and in high school, I went, you know, I learned we had auto mechanics, we had auto body, right? Yeah. So you learn how to fix your car and you learn how to paint your car. 
And then you had wood shop and metal shop, all the other stuff, which we don't have these days. No. And we need that back to teach kids. Even though I went a totally different route, but I learned all those skills and I still use them. I made my own, you know, chairs for my cabin, you know, because that was the time for me just to think about nothing when I'm making right. chairs. Right. Yeah. So, man, and I grew up in a household where my dad said uh, he never fixed anything. He had some tools, but for the most part, my dad would say, just pay people to do things. And, you know, I, that's just what I grew up as. And so I never learned how to change tires or do any of that stuff. I met my wife, the man who raised her was her grandfather, who was a shop teacher for 35 years. And he had this massive, like 80 foot by 60 foot shop on the property, man. And every tool you could ever imagine. So like, it was cool to like, you know, that before he passed away and the, the years that we were around him, like he got to show me like how to fix cars and, uh, you know, change stuff within cars and build stuff. And it was so much fun. And, but they don't have those classes anymore. It's just weird, man. And, and I agree when, if you're a busy person, yeah. right, have other people do certain things if you have enough money to, so you can focus on what you're, what you makes you money, but you really should know how to do it totally just just to do it so you can teach your girls how to change a tire right or i i taught our kids how to drive stick when there was a you know which is unheard of these days and it's totally. like you know why would you do that well because yeah. that way if there's only one car left and it's a stick shift they can drive it and get the heck out of there yeah oh so good i mean you ended up going into the navy as a hospital corpsman what was the the motivation to go to the navy versus like army or marines or any of that stuff um, let's see. My stepdad was a Marine, so okay. we'll just leave it at that. Okay. <laughs> and then my parents, my dad and uncle was air force. Okay. And, um, there was nobody around. So when I was, I didn't have that mentor. I didn't have that parent to guide me after my dad died. Um, not that he would have guided me the right way either. He was, um, I, and I say this a lot, been, he was totally racist. He was a bigot and I am not that way because of who he was and sure. how, you know, I saw that. Yeah. And even my mom to a certain point was, but he was an Iowa farm boy. And, and that's something that's ingrained you from learning that not from being born that way. My kids aren't, you know, they're, my kids are Asian and Hawaiian. And yeah. so I have a mixed household, right? It's so there's no way I could be anything, but I've been called that just because of the color of my skin. Sure. But they don't understand me. I forget where we're going with this, but anyway, yeah, no, I was just curious why you ended up going to the Navy. All right. So, the, so, the, so what I was getting, at, I was saying, there's nobody to guide me. Yeah. And it just happened to be at high school that they were the, the military day was there, you know, they came on campus and they talked about it. And I thought I wanted to go to medical school because my uncle was a chiropractor and I knew some other people were in the medical field. I'm like, do I really want to be a doctor? Cause I've heard horror stories up to the point, just from talking to people that they spent all this time and got to residency and then realized they hated it and didn't yeah. want to do it. Right. And it's a yeah. like attorneys who go to school. And after they've been working in it for 10 years after like, I hate this, I want to get to do a different job. So I, so I thought, you know what, go in as a medic, which is a hospital corpsman and, and see what I want to do. And so that's why I joined as a corpsman and you're supposed to see the world when you get in the Navy, right? Cause you go on ships. Well, I got, I went to station at camp. So I went to my boot camp and core school, which is the school to learn how to do hospital corpsman in San Diego. I got stationed at camp Pendleton at the hospital there, which is right in Oceanside, right after, you know, where California is at any parts of California. Yeah. 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 So it's right there. Santa, so uh, camp Pendleton is between San Onofre and San Diego. Right? It's that long stretch. So, that's where I ended up. And I stayed there my almost my whole time in until I went to a specialty school, which was physical therapy. And that was stationed at, in Texas at Fort okay. Sam Houston, where fast forward 25 years later, my son's there going to his specialty school for the army. Come so on. it was like kind of weird, you know, coming back there. Sure. And then oh, I got man. stationed back to Camp Pendleton for the rest of my training. And then they kept me there. So okay. I, yeah, so <laughs> go join. And I was the only guy in the Navy who never got on a ship. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. No, I'm, and I spoke to a lot of veterans on my show and they talked about like that transition back to civilized, you know, civilization, you know, back to civilization life, uh, civilian life there. What was that transition like for you? Cause I've, I've heard really good and I've heard some massive struggles. Well, well for me, I really didn't have that problem. Okay. So I tell people when I was in at the hospital at Camp Pendleton, it's a Navy hospital on a Marine Corps base. I said, it's like MASH. If you ever watch MASH and how the doctor and everybody just screwed, that's basically what, for me, the time <laughs> I was in at Camp Pendleton, right? awesome. there was some military part, but mainly, I mean, after I went to, after 
the 18 months I was there, I actually didn't even work a ward. I would never saw, I actually worked in this mobilization and planning and readiness teams and all this has hop secret clearance. So you come into work eight to five and you're out of there. Right. And you had Saturday, Sunday off, occasionally pulled duty. When I went okay. to a specialty school, I came back and it was even worse because we were the guys that were in charge of me, you know, the officers, <laughs> they, were, they were exactly like the people in MASH. They don't, they didn't care. They didn't care how long your hair was. They didn't care about anything. Yeah. And at the time I had the long, I actually had hair and it was the longest I've ever had it with regs. I learned how to do the regs and, and did it that way. Cause I was in San Diego, yeah. two things you do when you're in San Diego, you model and you try to do acting or something. And that's what I did when I was down there. Oh, that's so cool. That's another story for another day. <laughs> that's awesome. But, I mean, in, you end up going into the mortgage industry, which right. But let's stay. Let's stay here for one more second. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. All right. So when I was in the first two years, I really didn't. You know, I t tell everybody now, and we'll talk. This is why I do the Helping the Brave podcast. Is yeah. You're while when you go in, you need to plan how you're using the service hmm. because they know how they're using you, the government. They know exactly what they're going. You're going to do this, this, and this, and this. What yeah. are you going to get out of it? besides that and so when i was in i actually started after i came back to camp pendleton when i was a physical therapy i started going i got finished my bachelor's started working on my master's and when i got out i finished my master's and so i tell everybody use the military for that so for me i was at camp pendleton but i lived in oceanside and i went to school in vista so i rode my bike my, i used to do triathlons at the time so it was like i was not even in the service to a certain point right i couldn't quit of course sure other than yeah. that but, and, and so for me to transition out, I was already there. Okay. So I didn't go like overseas or someplace else and then come back and have to reacclimate. Right. I just, I was in the same house, didn't move. And I was never on base housing. I was off base housing. Okay. So, <laughs> That's awesome. The, the transition thing that most people have a problem with is you have such a focus on what your duty is while you're in. Yeah. That when you get out, you don't have a purpose. I knew my purpose by, cause I was going to school. I knew I wanted, I no longer wanted to be in the medical field. I wanted to be in business. I didn't know what yet, but I wanted to be in business. Oh, that's awesome. And, and how did you end up in the mortgage industry? I fell in it. Okay. And so, <laughs> and not kidding because when I got out, so I got out in the nineties and we were in a hit a recession. It was the one time you did, you know, one of those times where real estate, nobody was buying it kind of like what we're feeling right now for the next sure. 30 days. Gosh. Um, but I mean, people are going to come back. It's a different world, but at the time. So I, I went and did computers because I knew computers back then. And so I worked for a computer company. We sold through all the military exchanges. And then my neighbor next to me owned a mortgage company. And I knew this, unit, this whole division I set up for the military exchange system to sell our computers through was going to come to an end because of process. And so I was talking to him and he's like, hey, this is what I do. And so I came over and I was like, wow, this is what you get paid to do. Cause you know, because it, at the time I was taking people from 13 to nine and they loved me. And mm -hmm. so you you know, it's, it's, it was a different world. It was really high interest rates. We came out of the late eighties and then in the nineties, they started coming down. And since then we pretty much came down, went up a little bit, came down, went up and came down. Yeah. So, and I loved helping people build personal wealth through home ownership, which I didn't understand at the time. My parents didn't own the house we lived in. They rented they owned when we were in tech in Texas, I'm sorry, in Colorado, they owned 20 acres with a mobile home on it. So technically they didn't really own real estate. They own land. Right. And so it was not something my family knew. So for me, it was important. Once I got my first house, I was like, wow, you can actually build money this way. You can actually change your life. And most kids who, who grow up in a house that they own, the parents own, do better in school, do better in other things. Plus nobody can tell you to get out because they want to sell the house. Right, right, right. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, it, I'm a big fan of the acreage. I want the acreage. I've got my thing on the wall here that says if I can't pee up on front porch, my neighbors are too close. So I'm a big fan of the, the property one of these days. I mean, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, where I mean, the price up here Oof. has just been insane. It, Thanks I mean, to Californians. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, and not just Californians, but like we see a lot of plates, right? Like Washington, Oregon, but there's a lot of Californians moving up here for sure. And, and we're seeing just prices insane for you being in real estate and being in the mortgage there, are we going to continue to see the prices go up or are we seeing any sort of break anytime soon? How long do you have? Right. Yeah. <laughs> no, because I, I'm, and please, if I come off wrong, I don't mean to, they had me do a documentary after. So you didn't go to secret knock last year. You said I you missed were in, secret knock. Yeah, I've been to so, the last two prosperity camps. Right. So after, so right before that, there was this uh, traffic and conversion in San Diego 
And um, I was at that and I was talking to a lady who did documentary. I told her I'd do a radio show. And then she's like, I have to have you in my documentary. Can you, you know, what are you doing this Saturday? I'm like, well, let me check my calendar. Right. I didn't want to like say no, of course. R right. Sure. And yeah. So, so I was supposed to go. So I was going to secret knock. Right. And then after secret knock, that was that Saturday. Okay. And so I had to fly. I, so I went to secret knock. I told her I can make it. Don't worry about it. I'll be there. So I f drove home because I had my view or did I fly down there? I actually flew down there at the time, flew home yeah. and then got on the short hop from uh, Oakland to where it was at in Huntington Beach for that Saturday, showed up, did the documentary. And what we talked about was what I'm going to talk about now. So a lot of people think we're in a bubble, but the difference between 2006 and now there's multiple things, but first we have 14 million more households and 3 million less houses. Mm. So there's a math problem, right? We have more people who want houses than houses available. And there's also less rentals. But the reason we got here is if you go back from 2002 to 2006, and add in one more thing, the average age for someone to actually buy their first home and start their family all at the same time is 31 years old. Some people do it earlier, some people do it later, but on average, it's 31 years. So it's funny that if you go back 31 years from 2002, it's that thing that just popped up with in the news just the last few days, Roe versus Wade was put in and the de birth rates plummeted for the next tech decade, right? Mm. So you're there. So they're planning in 2002 to 2006 and on that we're all these people are coming of age at 31 that aren't coming of age at 31 because the, the birth rates are so much lower during that decade. So we built the most homes we've ever built in 2005 and 2006. It was 1.5 million and 1.6 million. Wow. The, and we thought we needed them because they were being absorbed at the new home build places, right? Well, the mm -hmm. problem was we had these programs. You could do 100% financing. You only needed a pulse. And people could buy two and three homes with no, you know, with not qualifying, all that kind of stuff. If you don't understand what I'm talking about, just watch the movie, The Big Short. The guy's in there talking to a stripper and she's like, I'm closing on my third house. And he's like, how are you buying a house? And she, you know, that's the reason. Yeah. And, and the programs that we had, they would have been fine if they were rated properly. And that's what The Big Short explains to you is they, the bond agencies that rated these, that when they sold them onto the secondary market, rated them as AAA and they should have been like Ds or Es, mm. right? That's bad, by the way. Yeah. Right? Just in case it's the opposite of boob sides, right? Okay. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> right? right. The bigger, the better, usually. Anyway, sure. whatever. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, however you want it. But no, yeah. so the problem was they rated them so which they should have been raised. So who should have went to jail during after that would, would have should have been the bond agencies that rated them that way to sell them, not the banks, not the other people who, who actually got in trouble, but the rating agencies. Gotcha. So now we have to, so we go through that, right. And everything falls apart in 2006 and it really big into, so from 2007, eight, nine, 10, 11 into 12, we're absorbing all those homes that we overbuilt. Mm. So nobody was building anything. Right. We and we built the least amount of homes from 2010, listen, 2010 to 2019. We built 7.5 million homes, which was the least amount of any 10 year period. Like the, it's the same as 1930 to 1939. Those two years built the same amount of homes. So figure that out. 1930 yeah. to 1939, we just came out of, um, you know, we just had the Spanish flu. We had all this other stuff. And so they didn't build as many homes either. So you fast forward to today. Fannie Mae says we're short 4.3 million homes and Freddie Mac says 4 million homes. Some people I hear, I've been talking to say about 5 million homes. So they say we need to build 2 million homes a year for a decade to get caught up. Wow. Right. So, but everybody, all we think of is 2008. Got to be a bubble. Got to be a bubble. Got to be a bubble because the house prices went up. Yeah. The problem now is people need a place to live. And if you can't buy, you're going to rent. Well, there's not enough places to rent and there's not enough places to buy, right? So what it's, right now what's happening with the rates moving up is the fact that instead of having in the FHA realm, you know, so there's many different programs, but most people start with FHA and that's it to a certain dollar amount. So FHA and conventional and then um, you know USD, those are all in the certain lower end, not lower end, but that, that price point, everybody's in it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're fighting for homes. So in my area, 400,000, 460,000, which really is four, 
is 476,000 purchase price and below is for FHA. That market had 24 offers or 20 offers or whatever. And that price went on down. Now that's down to about 10 offers or seven offers. They're still there. You can still only get one person in that home, right? There's only one person going to buy it. And then if you fast, if you look at the higher up stuff, there's again, maybe one to two offers. So is it going to cause us to go? I just think we're going to see, get back to normal appreciation, not 22%, not 28% quarterly in Idaho. I know San Diego was 28% as of last month for year over year. Phoenix, Arizona was 30% year over year. That just prices so many people out. And what the rate increase did, we went almost, we went two to two and a quarter interest rate in, increase in the last 45 days, which took 9 million people out of the home buying market. Wow. Now those, Man. and that means you got 9 million more renters. Yes. And that's a bad thing. Man, that is, the way that you said that was explained a lot. And I was part, we bought our first house in 2006, just like idiots. We, we bought no, the because first nobody, house. Yeah, it we wasn't because house idiot house because someone told you to do it. And it was a great thing at the time. No one well, thought we were going to, right? Totally. Yeah. And, and, and I totally blame the real estate agent that we worked with at the time because he was like, oh yeah, it's a good deal, man. Like, you know, on rating you know. agencies were who was wrong, not the real estate agents, not the loan officers, not the people. It was yeah. the bond rating agencies. Right. If they would have, if they would have rated those right, that would have been a 9% and a 6% market and nobody would have taken those. Yes. And that's what it was. And we got, we did the hundred percent, like mm -hmm. no money down, like mm -hmm. all that stuff. And, uh, our, our mortgage was like $2,300 the month, you know, at that time. And it was in the ghetto, ghetto, ghetto South of Seattle area. And then we ended up short selling in 2014. We've been renting since. And up here in Coeur said, I think two months ago, my buddy's a real estate agent said there was only 11 homes in all of North Idaho that were 650 K or less on the market. It was just insane. Um, man. Yeah, so, so, and so and that's the other thing. In order to have a bubble, we need yeah. to be 12 months or more of inventory. Hmm. We're still under a month of inventory nationwide, which means that we have like 890,000 homes nationwide, nationwide, right? Which at the top of the market where, you know, we hit the pandemic, not the pandemic, but the great recession and all that, we have 3.7 million for sale. There's, yeah. there's a difference, Matt, if you, and, and that's the, the problem right now is yes, things are going to slow down till we get, you know, but not slow down to a point where we're going to see the values go down. We're just going to see a lot less people being able to buy these homes. And that's yeah. a bad thing because if you look at California, for example, which is what's happening from here goes there or somewhere else, yep. you're going to get 70% of the market can only rent. Right. Why do you, why do you think all these companies are buying up all these homes? They can get their hands on to rent them to people there. And the other problem is, so you normally had builders building homes and then they would sell them, right? One in four is being built to rent only whole housing tracks are being built to rent only because of the profit that they can make off of renting them to people. Wow, man, that's unbelievable. It's huge. It, yeah. I had no idea about it till last year when I went to Steve Sim Speakeasy in Austin. I was yeah. sitting next to a guy who was at Prime Mortgage and, you know, we all can, are connected at one point, but, and he was like, Hey, have you heard about this? These tracks? I'm like, no, no. I was, it was shocked to me. I never heard of it. And then I sat down next to a guy that was a Google ad agency. I'll tell you his name afterwards. And he's like, Hey, yeah, check this out. See these, we're building these for rent, all these. And he was one of those guys that have the money and REITs that have the money that they can, they're doing these. Wow. And so that's the other problem. You're taking out builders who would normally build houses to sell for everybody. Now are building them just to rent and they're popping up all over. Cause it's such a huge thing. Cause people can't afford to buy. So they're going to be stuck in renting. Mm. Remember the uh, it's a wonderful life Pottersville. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we're going to dude. <laughs> Oh, that's unbelievable, man. I, I love to finish my, my show with a, a fun question. I'm a big music guy. What's a favorite type of music for you or favorite band for you? Dude, I like everything. Um, yeah. I, so I got me a F-250 diesel, so I have to listen to country in that. Okay. Um, nice. And I like all country. Um, but, yeah. you know, when I was in the Navy down in San Diego, I was into punk and, my, you know, all that new wave stuff and all that. So I listen to everything. Nice. So I don't have a favorite Right. I mean, one of the things you didn't hear before you came on, I had a blaring in my studio, you know, it was all the nineties rock and stuff. So I love it. I, dude. Yeah. So I listen to everything. I listen <laughs> to rap. I listen to everything. I have no, but if I'm on my truck, 
it's definitely some type of country. Yeah. Oh, awesome, man. Ed, such an honor to have you on my show. Thank you for your service, your time, man, sharing your knowledge with us, man. I love it, man. There's going to be some awesome knowledge bombs dropped in this show uh, for a ton of people, man. Thank you so much for taking time. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And if anybody needs to get a hold of me, then you can just find me at edparko.com everywhere or Ed Parko on all social. Awesome. And I'll drop those down in the show notes as well. Ed, thank you again, man. Really appreciate it. Hey, thank pleasure. you so much for checking out the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to take a listen or a watch. It's truly an honor to be able to speak with such amazing guests, and I hope that they've made an impact on your life in some way, shape, or form. And you can do me one big favor. That would be huge. Click that subscribe button, and then second favor, hit that share button. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate you. Keep changing the world. I believe in you.